There's only three definite outcomes. He dies. I die. Or a catch it. Well, after the most incredible six months angling that I'd had in many a year, there was only one job left to do, and that was to target the king of the lake, Tyson. The carp that, if I was lucky enough to catch it, would have been the biggest carp I'd ever caught in the UK. It's not every day you fish for a PB, and it was the natural stepping stone after working my way through the rest of the stock. 2022 was gonna turn out to be a year of immense lows, really, really pain barrier angling but I never took my sight off the prize. This incredible mahogany breeze block of a common. And I firmly believed at that point that if I kept going, at some point it had to be mine. So after you saw me last, I carried on fishing at Grendon up until about, I think probably about a week before Christmas and it carried on being good. <laughs> I, blame, I blame the guys filming this actually because the session that you come and filmed me was a blank and it was the only blank I had that winter and the reason was <laughs> these lads, they're so full of that, right? So we're in the swim, two nights. You have to, when it gets dark, it's all about listening. You have to hear a pin drop on there and then you're moving. Like, no matter how many times I told them to keep the noise down, like, constant chatter. And as a result, it's my excuse, I never found a fish. And I realised right at the end of the session where they were. I'd like to think if I'd been on my own, I probably would have got on them. As a result, that session was a blank. But I came back the following week and caught uh, a £30 an ounce's mirror. And then the following week after that, I had a £42 common, like in freezing cold weather. So really, really buzzing with those. And then all of a sudden it was the end of the year and Christmas, the natural break. I think um, there was some sort of lockdown or something they said about. So everything sort of ground to a halt. So I didn't pick, pick up the carp fishing until February. It was the third week of February. So I'd had a nearly a two month layoff. And when I went back, I have to say by that point, I was starting to really focus on the objective, which was Tyson. And I say that because when I started fishing Grendon, obviously he was in a lot of ways the ultimate carp residing in the lake. But I went there just to fish for beautiful big fish in the Neen Valley. And um, sorry for all your nenners out there, Nen Valley, Neen Valley, don't put an E on it. So I went there just to enjoy my fishing. And as that first season passed by, I was left with, with a ridiculous sort of six months of fishing behind me that I could never have imagined, having caught some incredible fish. And all of a sudden it seemed quite plausible and, and almost the natural next step to think about Tyson, to think, right, actually, I've managed to catch just about, or a good share of the others, crazy six months. Let's start recalibrating and resetting and thinking about the king of the lake, the biggest fish in there, which, uh, had been 50, mid 50, really, really seriously big common carp. So it was only at that point that he started coming into my mind every session, before every session. And you can well imagine that having had the six months that I'd had, where from June to December, I'd managed to catch 47 carp out of a lake with only 40 in it. I thought going back in the spring would just be a simple matter of carrying on where I'd left off but I couldn't have been more wrong. So with what I thought was a real going tactic and obviously bag full of, bagfuls of confidence and, and everything, I've gone into it and the first thing that happened was, was on that return trip back end of February. Can be a very good time for big fish, but it's very weather dependent and site specific. But you know, you get hatches and stuff going on and, and I was keen and eager and buzzing. You know, I've had two months thinking about it and reflecting on the on the uh, the fortunate success that I had had and thinking how I, how I was going to try and finalise things and take it through to the next level. So I've gone back and 
on this particular day I'm facing into an easterly wind and I remember all day like my eyes were just like streaming to you know when it's really cold and 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 but I was looking saw nothing all day and I was really glad when it was too dark to see anything because at that point I thought I'm going in a bivy now and I'm going to zip the door up thaw out put the heat the, the stove on cook some soup whatever so I've gone in there and sat down pitch dark and I thought what was that that was a carp surely not it's bloodoosh right out in the distance can't have been I thought well I'm getting put my coat back on I probably had my coat still because it was freezing went back out had a listen winds coming in still freezing colder like rays and I thought no nah, can't have been one just turned around to go back in the bivy another one right pinpointed it stood there like a statue listened for half hour another one I mean this is unbelievable you think like it's only there's only 40 carp in the lake and they're big old fish and it's freezing it's early in the year well it's still winter so that was it I've 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 gone round there stood in the swim and I've pinpointed them well it's quite easy to do because that night there were about well there was 60 70 80 shows third week of February on a big fish water it was it was incredible the nearest ones were like heads of 40 pounders coming out 10 10 foot in front of me up to about 60 yards out they went mental and to this day I've never seen a display like it on an out and out big fish water when the water has been that cold it just shows you know something flicks their their switch and whether it's the air pre- I don't know what it was that night it was a bad moon phase it was freezing cold it was an easterly wind something sent them berserk anyway i moved on them there was no one else on the lake so moving was easy and straightforward no one else was mad enough to be out but it was like it was like the height of summer when when they've just it it was amazing i'll never forget it got on them and i fished on them for two nights and did not have anything and trust me i tried everything during that and i ended up on zigs um the liners that i had before i went on to zigs were just off the scale i was so on them and I couldn't get a bite and that carried on pretty much that dynamic of being on fish heavily on fish every single trip carried on from the 22nd of February until believe it or not May and it was one of the most draining beating yourself up uh, confidence destroying two or three three months oh, what is that three months or whatever um, that I've ever gone through because you have to remember that I've gone from like a crescendo of, of, of just success after success and it seemed like, you know, I just couldn't do anything wrong, to coin a phrase, to suddenly bang, nothing. And when I say nothing, nothing. I couldn't get anything. I couldn't get a bite on, on zigs. I couldn't get a bite on worms. I couldn't get a bite on singles. I couldn't get a bite on maggots. I couldn't get a bite on stringers, singles, bags, anything. I tried it luncheon meat sweet corn and every trip i was getting on these fish and i could not get a bite off them and i'm not very good at many things in carp fishing but i think i've always thought that if i've got fish in front of me i can usually figure out how to get a bite from them because i used to do a lot of match fishing well i'll tell you what i couldn't get a bite off these it culminate i mean I've, I've, i gave the zigs a real go had a devastating uh, outcome in march when it was still freezing fowl looked one of the real big ones nearly 50 pound in the peck obviously it was in the uh, just unhooked in let it go crushed by that then i'm thinking what the hell am i doing with zigs i hate zigs and then and it went on and on and it was a very 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 cold spring probably the coldest spring i i can remember having but it didn't change for me until may and i remember getting this bite in may I think it was the 5th of May or something. So I've gone all the way through, like having started early in February, thinking I'll get on there early, try and get some some knowledge under my belt and be ready for when it really kicks off, end of March, April, and then I've got all of April, all of May. So I've gone through April, nothing, banging month. You know, there were, it's fair, fair, I suppose, to say the lake didn't go crazy, but there were fish getting caught by other people, you know, some, some very good anglers on there. And the odd fish, excuse me, was getting caught but nothing of any real significance but significant to me because I haven't caught anything and I'm trying desperately hard week after week and all of April's gone I'm into May still freezing cold still wearing salopettes in May it was that brutally cold and I managed to get on them again and finally I I managed to get this bite this absolutely savage bite incredible fight and I caught this 37 pound mirror which was 
a turning point, I think you could say. So after that 37 pounder, which I'll tell you what, after, you can imagine like fishing it every week from 22nd of February to the 5th of May, nothing and being on them every single trip, no matter what, whether I sat up on them or whether I moved to get on them, I was getting on them. And so when that fish came, it was, it was like one of the greatest shot in the arms that I could have ever had in my angling. I suddenly thought, right, thank God I could still catch them, you know? So I then went, the problem was that to catch that fish, I did sort of scratchy bitty fishing to try and get that bite. And I then thought that was the way forward and, and it probably wasn't. So I carried on fishing like that, caught a couple more, nothing of any real consequence, a couple of the stockies. And it wasn't until the end of June when I, I so I've gone all the way again through like nearly a two month period of just like scratching the odd one and I'm thinking, what have I got to do? And then I thought, do you know what? None of these things I'm trying to work in. And I've gone suddenly like it's ground to a halt. I need to just go back to what I was doing before, which was just straightforward boily fishing. And I hadn't really done much of it in the spring because it was really cold. So I thought, I'm just going to go back to the long links, big lead, fish where I see them, uh, and, and a stringer and a bottom bait and, and just put a few baits out with a throwing stick or whatever. So, so I went back to that and I think it was July when I started doing that. And then from July all the way through the rest of the year, um, it didn't stop. It was just like, my God, why didn't I just do this again before? Because I caught on this, these tactics before, but and every time again it went from so having put that that ridiculously painful period behind me i then went completely flipped it round to catching every single time i, I went again for for months month after month and it, it was a real strange journey but the problem that i had was by this point in time as you go from 47 fish 50 fish 55 fish 60 fish you you obviously with a lake that's got 40 carp, you're getting into the, the, the really firmly into the territory of recaptures. And that's a real difficult thing because when you work so hard for a bite and it comes in and it's one you've caught before, basically what you have to do is you have to learn to love a recapture. Because if, if it just has a negative downer on you, oh, I've caught it before, oh, I was playing it, I thought it might be that way it was, and it's, oh, it's one I've caught before. If all you take away from it is a negative, and that's pretty much what's going to be your angling because by that point really there was only a couple left to catch so I was the reality was I was going to get a lot of repeats so the only way I could turn that into a positive was to embrace a recapture and go hello mate how are you yeah we get you out do a quick picture and send you on your way you know so that's what I did you know and, and, and I managed to sort of mentally turn my state of mind round to a recapture was still a major result which in a lot of ways it was because it's you know it's a tough tough lake so so the summer's ticked on, the weeds come up, which made fishing very, very interesting. A couple of weed beds out in the middle, and the first year I fished it, there was no weed at all. So moving on to fish and getting fishing was, was very easy. The interesting thing was that on the first year when there was no weed, the fish, if you moved on them, they tended to stay. And then the second year when there was weed, they were more twitchy and more flighty. And normally it'd be complete diametrical opposite of that. So I don't know what was going on there, but definitely true. The second year, they were more twitchy, more flighty, more susceptible to pressure. And it required a lot more persistent angling. So whereas in the first year I'd managed, if I could get on them, I could apply a bit of bait and maybe extract a few bites sometimes if it was a really good session. Now it was move with the fish, move with the fish, just keep wearing it. It's like a war of attrition. You know, most of the time when you put that bait in front of the fish, they might not have it. But if you keep putting it in front of them, they will have it. You're just bludgeoning them into submission. And that's what I did. I just kept moving, moving and moving. I remember like, well, several sessions I'd move six swims in three nights, you know, seven swims in three nights. Um, it was, you know, but it didn't, it didn't matter because the fish were mobile and I had to be mobile and um, it was rewarding me every time. So even though I'd move all those times I would never leave without a fish you could argue maybe you know if I'd stayed in one spot and just fished maybe I would have caught but and there were certainly a couple of times where I had moved and the fish carried on showing where you know I messed up 
and then someone would go in where I was and then they'd catch, you know, so sometimes you're kicking yourself. But I kept really busy, I kept on it and, um, you know, you're doing a lot of nocturnal manoeuvres, early watches and just trying to keep ahead of them and, and trickling a bit of, I'm putting in a Manila Active, I would take five kilos with me every time I went, every single week, I'd take 5k and I'd try to make sure that I didn't come home with any. So not a lot of bait, you know, when you're talking about out of those 40 fish, you know, you've got two possible 50s, a couple of upper 40s and a lot of other big fish as well. So not a lot of bait. And if I'm moving around fishing different swims, it's only like 100 baits in each swim and you move and, and so on. So I get through it, but it meant that the bait, the bait was getting spread around. And I started fishing wherever I saw them just with a matching bait, the same as what I've been putting in. And if I cast and got a drop, I left it. So I ended up ditching the wrapping sticks. And even though there was weed that year, if I felt that lead at the bottom, then I left it. And nine times out of 10, it would, well, not that, no, that's completely not true. Very often, well, all, all of my fish that I caught came to doing that. And I also found it was really interesting that if I put bait in over the rigs, the more bait I put in, the less I caught. Spreading it around in little bays and under trees, a few handfuls here, a little bit there, up in the corner, that was fine. But if you fished over bait, it seemed to be the kiss of death. And it seemed that if you just had a bottom bait and a stringer and you left it, they'd eat it because it didn't represent any danger to them. I'm up on long hook links like, I mean, all my angling life, I've been obsessed with short hook links. Really, you know, like down to one inch sometimes. Certainly anything more than five inches would be like a zig rig to me. So now I'm finding myself using, because I started going longer and longer because obviously I'm just fishing for a drop. So a bit of technical stuff. So I'm fishing for a drop. So to know that I was fishing, I wanted a long link. I had a three bait string I wrapped around a hook and my links went longer and longer. So a lot of the time I'd be fishing in silt or maybe over blanket weed. I caught a couple actually fishing in the thick pockets of weed, which I never would normally do. And it just would, you just, it would go. You'd think, shouldn't really leave that, should I? No, they're in it, they're fizzing in the weed. Right, leave it. And then three hours later, you'd be playing a 35 pounder. It was crazy fishing, different to what I've normally done, where I'm normally focused on spots, pinpoint accuracy and really short rigs. This was the absolute opposite. And my rigs went longer and longer. I ended up about, I never measured them, but they were probably getting on for 20 inches, certainly 18 inches long. A style of fishing that I guess you don't really see, and that's, why it worked I think you know the bait on the hair was the same as the baits I've been feeding and it just worked and I went through the summer getting a few recaptures but getting some new ones you know and that was like you imagine getting a recapture you you made yourself see it as a positive well when you do look in the net so now you're starting to think every every time you that was another thing prepare for the worst so I'm playing a fish in I think it's probably going to be a recapture it's probably going to be a re even if it felt like massive and I think I wouldn't go, no, it's probably Tyson, or I try not to. Although there was a couple of times I'd say where I thought, oh my God, this could be it. And it wasn't. But I'd always think, oh, this will be one I know. Let's see which one it is. So when it wasn't, you look in the net and it's one you haven't caught before. Mega buzz. Absolute zenith, you know. And I caught some mirrors, a couple of like big upper 20, 29, 28 pound mirrors. And the mirrors are really rare in there. And they were just just to die for these fish, really nice. And it was interesting actually, because with the bait angle, when I went back in, it was on the boilies, it was like nearly July, and I've gone in on the krill active. The water was clear, it was weedy, big old fish screaming out fish meal to me. So, the geese are coming in to do their territorial battles on the island tonight, that'd be lovely. Um, so I've gone in with the krill active and the really interest, interesting thing was, out of those 40 fish, less than 10, I would say, probably, if you exclude, probably less than 10 of a, a, a mirrors. So mostly, most of the fish in the Lake of Commons. So I went back with the Krill Active. First bite, mirror. Second bite, mirror. Next trip. Next trip, mirror. I was like, what? Can't be a bait thing, surely. Next trip, a mirror. So I had like four or five mirrors back to back. Like, just unbelievable. And I thought, so I looked at the history of the bait, of the bait, uh, the preferences on the lake, and I thought, you know what, I'm just going to go back in. I'm going to go. I'm going to ditch the krill, and I'm going to go in with a manila. And I went in with a manila. The very next trip, I caught one of the big commons. 
Then the next trip I caught a big common. Next trip I caught a mirror. Then I caught a big common. So the krill active on there was very site specific. If you use the krill active, you catch the mirrors, but you wouldn't catch the commons. If you use the manila active, you catch both of them, right? So it was by process, process of elimination, it, that's how it worked out. And um, so it had been a real, uh, what would you say? I mean, a, a massive hard work summer, but you know, coming away with the result every trip was, was the objective and I feel like when I think back now, looking on myself then, it was like another person. It feels like, it was like there was like a 2.0 version of myself that existed just for a few months. So I'd love to get back to that. Probably never would. But if you know, everyone's probably got one great campaign in them, and for me, that was you know, it, I just seemed to know where they'd be, where they'd go, and if I kept putting in the effort, looking and watching, I could get on them and, and extract a bite. And as as you go sort of through the summer, I mean, there were other things like going on like flirtations with surface fishing. I failed to, to catch one. I lost one on a floater and float, they never get caught out there on floaters. And that was one of my targets for the year was to get one on a floater and I hooked it and the hook come out. But that's, an, that's another story anyway, but I'm chasing them all over the place. And one, one uh, evening in early September, so I'm, get, I'm starting to stare down a barrel of autumn now you know, and I'm thinking, am I going to be on here for Tyson next year? It's quite possible. Now I'm up to probably 70 odd fish or something like that. And I'm thinking I've practically caught them twice over. What have I got to do? And you start to think, I don't really want to be on here next year. And it's, loads of things are going through my head. But the, the biggest thing was that I'm thinking, right, he's going to get caught in October. There's no doubt about it. He's coming out in October, but I'm not going to catch him. That might seem a really odd thing to say, but I knew that a load of anglers were going to descend in, in, um, in October because they knew that he was probably going to come out and he was going to be massive. And it's a really busy lake. There's 35 anglers, like really good anglers, load, loads of people with, with time and, and ability. So I thought, look, saying to yourself that you're going to try and catch him in October when everyone else is going to be doing the same thing, it's not going to happen. So what I decided to do was completely forget about that whole autumn, October harvest moon. And what I was going to do was force a bonus capture out of that fish, either in September or in November. That was what I thought I was going to, I thought, let, just let, let him get caught. Don't panic, because it's easy to think like, oh, you, you, someone's going to catch him. Like, I've got to get down there. and Just, just accept someone's going to catch him. It's loads of good people, someone's going to get him, don't stress. Aim to force that bonus capture by pressure at war of attrition. If you keep that pressure on, you can force a bonus capture in either September or November. So that was my, my thinking. So it's September, one of the months that I thought, you know, I can, I can squeeze him out in this month. And I found myself in a part of the lake which the carp got into quite a lot the previous year they didn't get in there a lot that particular year last year which is this long arm but this night they got in there big style and I managed to get in there and get on them and I, I got my rods fanned out all just on stringers I think I might have had two there on bait but one one out there right over to the far margin and it's gone in with with depth and hard it's gone on a right crack down Never used to bother me if it dropped deep and soft and silt and so on because still seemed to do bites. But when it went deep and it's landed like on a dinner table, I'm like, oh, I'll have that one, thank you. Um, and later on that evening, they started rolling over the zone really in the dark, about nine, 10 in the evening. And, and in this corridor, this arm, which is just like tree line, the echoes, the sound, they're only 60 yards away from you and the sound of these hippos going over, I mean, it's immense when they're up in that arm. And I'm, I'm listening to these fish in the dark, one swim up from where my rods were, talking to one of the other anglers, Nick. And I was chatting to Nick, we're listening to like, it's electrifying. We, we're both stood there in the dark, listening to these fish lolloping over. And then suddenly in my pocket, bip, 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 I ran to my swim, which was only, like it was one swim up, ran down to the swim, right hand rod that's gone on this crack down on the, t on the dinner plate on the far side, picked it up, this fish has flat rodded me from the off, couldn't even get it up, just ripping braid off the reel, going down the arm, 
And what, what from there it just turned into one of those battles where I, I actually this was when I thought this this is Tyson. This has to be Tyson. It was so heavy. And it came in fairly quietly after that first run. It came in then under the rod tip, up and down for 20, 20 minutes at least, which is a long time when a fish is only 25 yards out in front of you. Massive inky boils coming up in the blackness. It's not a lot of light gets into that arm. We see these boils. Nick, Nick said, do you want me to net it for you? I said, yes, please. Nick's very experienced. I mean, you couldn't ask for a better netsman. So Nick's gone down to the water with the net. And this fish, well, when it broke surface, when it actually breached, it coughed and gurgled like something you never heard before. Reminded me of an ex-girlfriend. And, uh, and it's sort of this inky boil up and that. And um, I thought, my God, this must be tight. And now my shoulder's really throbbing and aching. And like, you get that, I always get that twinge there just from the, the extra weight that a big fish puts lean, when it's leaning on you. And, and there was no doubt from the everything about it. And, and Nick's gone down with the net and he was down there. I mean, Nick's older than me and he was down there, crouched down. And I, I, after a while, I said, Nick, I'm really sorry. Cause I started to think he's probably getting cramp in his back or something. <coughs> I said, I will get it up. I, think I said that to me, ex-girlfriend as well. And, I, and eventually I, I, I just, I could just discern the, the leader coming out of the, out of the water. And then and another big boy, it's coughed and gurgled again. And then Nick's reached out and it's gone in the net. And I heard the tail uh, flop over the draw cord as it's gone in, so I knew it was a, a monster. I'm thinking, this is it, this is Tyson. This is the culmination of everything. Put the rod down, Nick's got the net, went and got a head torch, came back, shone it in the net. Massive common, really long, which Tyson is. Massive head, which Tyson's got. And, um, but a full set of, of tail flutes, which Tyson hasn't got. He's got a, a flattened off top lobe. I thought, no, it's not him. It's a different one. I've rolled it over and I like, couldn't work out what it was. After a, after a minute or two, the pennies dropped. It was a fish called the Long Common, which had not been caught by anyone for over two years on that lake. Which to me, still, with the amount of pressure you get see on there, it's mind blowing how they avoid capture. But this creature, had had done it and it was just uh, just under two it was just under 45 pound 44 14 ounces of pristine hardly ever caught immensely long perfect in every way common carp and it wasn't tyson but it was in some ways it was even better because it was one that they thought as it died you know there's a lot of big commons in there so even when you see them in the water you're not always a hundred percent what you're looking at so we didn't know if the long common was still there and it was and it was in my net and and it was massive as i said and um so going forward from that capture ticked a really rare one off the list and now you think well tyson wherever you are i'm having you because if i can catch him i'm definitely catching you and all i was intent on was forcing that bonus capture as we went into the autumn and not stressing about someone else catching it. And um, that's when things started to get really interesting. After the long common met my net in early September, you're at that point in the angling calendar, obviously you're on the threshold of busy banks again. The football tournaments are over, summer holidays are gone, and people are starting to get out on the lakes for those big fish. And everyone knew Tyson was probably gonna make an appearance October time, as I mentioned. And with that the anglers by middle of september the lake got busier and busier i mean it's a busy lake anyway there's about 35 man syndicate on 15 acres so even during the week you could have 10 on on a weeknight but you did see the the pressure ramping up as september progressed predictably um but i was prepared for it i didn't let it phase me i just kept focusing on tyson 
becoming mine either during September or in November, which would have been the second caption because, as I said, I was just banking on someone catching it. If you think you've got all those anglers descending on the lake through October and they all know how to catch him, they all, they're all good enough, you know, someone, the, the odds of it being you are so infinitesimally small that that's why I decided to just take that stress of worrying about it out of my head, accept it's going to happen and just get on with my angling. So, so things carried on progressing through September. We were nicking a fish or two every trip and probably two out of three were repeats, but every now and again, I'd get a new one. Uh, a couple of nice mid-30 commons, um, a couple of mirrors that I hadn't caught. And every time, now, now you're starting to think, when you're playing it, you're starting to think, this could be him, you know? And I remember one fish in particular a real hard fighting mirror that I caught at long range. And it, it really, really did fight hard. And it was like, it, was, it wasn't a big fish. It, well, it was a big fish, but it wasn't a 50 pounder. Um, and during a fight, you're thinking this could be it. And it started to get to that point where you think it's gonna, it's gonna happen, you know, it's gonna, you could just feel it building. But at the same time, you sort of, you sort of supercharge yourself to get through the tiredness because it was demanding angling to keep yourself in the frame of, of, of catching um, because to my mind the only way of catching him was to catch as many as I could that had been my outlook from the beginning instead of just perhaps trying to find one or two idiosyncrasies in his character and focusing on them it was just like well, if you can catch us if you can catch them all then you'll catch them that's sort of always been sort of mostly how I've gone about my sort of fishing um, is just to keep the bites coming. And, and that's what I was focused on doing. I think when I decided to revert to the really long links and the stringers and the straight boily approach, um, I, I, from the moment I started doing that, the key thing was I could literally see myself catching him like that. I just knew I could catch him like that. There was no question in my mind whatsoever. If he come across that, I was gonna catch him. So that was a big deal, you know, to have that in your your mental locker is, is a, a big deal. Every time I cast that out, I, I thought it's going to happen. And September went into October and suddenly now, by this point, I was on about 74 or 75 carp for two summers. Um, and obviously a spring of pain where I didn't catch anything. A lot of people were descending on the lake, as I said, we're all speculating on how big Tyson's going to be. And I'm thinking, you know, he's, he's not going to be as big as some had thought, but I thought he's going to be 53, 54 pound, which is a massive fish. And it's an incredible common carp. And you're sort of like looking for it. I'm looking for him now. And I'm thinking every time I'm at the lake, I'm visualizing where is he right now? What is he doing? Who's he with? And there was a couple of times where I'd seen shows which, which one in particular which had to be Tyson there was there was just no mistake there is another fish of similar size but it's a fish known as Geordie which is really really dark so you couldn't really mix mix the two of them up and I'd seen this fish in this sort of central area of the lake towards the end of September and I'd seen another big show in that area end of September beginning of October one of them was definitely Tyson another one was a big really big carp. I remember as it was leading up you sort of again I'm just thinking through October just just keep trying to get bites. We'll try and catch Tyson in November maybe even December when it gets quiet. Whoever catches in, in, him in October I'll help him out with the pictures buy him a bottle of wine and you know it's all good. So that was my mindset it's, it's quite a strange mindset because I felt really close and I felt like it was destined to happen and I was forcing it to happen but at the same time I thought, well, it's not going to happen in October. It's a really weird thing. It got to uh, the end of the first week in October and we had a, a weekend of, of solid rain, absolute tumult tumultuous downpours all weekend where I, was living, where I live in Suffolk. And when I got up to go to the lake on Monday morning, I got up about half four and I could hear the rain on the outside of the house absolutely thundering down, like what I call movie rain. And when I drove to the lake, I remember driving in a pitch black to the lake. All the way, I had to have my wipers on full speed. It was just a really rare morning. And as I got to the lake, the rain sort of dried up. 
the sky cleared a bit and I stood on the boards looking at a central area of the lake and there were three other anglers on spread about and I got there just, just on first light and I looked and I looked and I didn't see anything and about an hour passed, nothing, I'm thinking where, where I'm going to go. Now quite often I'd be not setting up a, a pitch sometimes for an entire day, certainly most of the day quite often because I would only set up when I was happy that I was in an area where the fish were. So the fact that a couple of hours had passed since being at the lake at first light didn't really faze me. But then I saw a fish show um, right out in the middle zone. And the, the, the only problem with it was that it was in front of a, a swim called the point, which commanded a big central chunk of the water. But as you, as you can appreciate, when, when you see a fish show, you want to exactly triangulate that position so you know exactly where it showed. But where I saw it show from, was, was right around the other side of the lake, so it was a bit of a guessing game, but I thought it had to be in that area, the same sort of area where I'd seen Tyson and that other big show. It was the only show that morning, nothing else happened. And it, it felt cold and it was obviously very, very damp and wet and the lake was quite lifeless. To just see one show, no fizzing, nothing, was fairly unusual, but that was all I had to go on. I thought, well, you know what? I'm just going to go and get as close to that as I can. So I went round to one, the other end of the lake and fished out long, still probably 50 yards away from where I needed to be. But I thought, I'm going to put some rods out here. I'm not going to put bivy up. I'm just going to sit and watch the lake and, and see what's occurring. And the swim I wanted to get into, which definitely where that fish showed, the point swim, which was opposite me, was occupied. But I made a cup of tea and I was watching and I was trying to figure out what was going on and I thought, I saw a bit of movement in that swim and I realised the guy was packing up. Major blessing really, you know. So I threw my gear, uh, packed everything up, threw it in a van, drove round there just as he was going and it was uh, my mate Mark, one of the bailiffs on there, really good guy and he was just leaving. We had a chat, he went and I'm, I'm stood in the swim and I'm now thinking right I saw it from over there and I'm thinking right it's that I narrowed it down to about a 30 square yard area of water that I wanted my rigs in I've um, got my rods all sorted out and I, it was going for a long chuck this this zone was about 100 yards out from the bank dispatched them out there and the, the first one it's interesting the first one whenever I got in a swim the first rod that I put out was always the one that did the bite it was really, it's like, it's because the first one you put out is like your banker, isn't it? It's the one you're, you're, you're most certain and most happy with. It's always that one that went. And um, so I put the, the right hand rod, went, what turned out to be the right hand rod, went out first and I sent it out. And it just, I remember watching it going out and it's gone down lovely and it landed deep and soft. It went down really deep and it was an area that I hadn't fished before. But like I, was, I said earlier, you know, if I felt, if I felt it hit the bottom, you know, a hundred yards out, you know, if you feel that land is fishing and with a real long link and a string, I was, I was totally happy. So the other two, I sort of put just a bit left and just a bit left again. And I had all three boxed in this area. Spent the rest of the day watching the lake, nothing at all happened. It was just one of those real, real quiet phases. And at dusk, nothing happened. So pretty much, you know, 20 hours into the session, I'm, I'm fishing for one show which was fair, quite rare, normally I could, you know, if you, if you, you would see a bit more, but it was obviously, maybe it was all that cold rain, don't know, there had been an enormous amount of pressure at the weekend, every swim had been taken, so there was obviously bait out there. But for whatever reason, the lake was very, very quiet, and um, when, I, I, when I settled down that night, about 11 o'clock at night, because I listened through into dark, nothing, nothing at all, didn't have, any, didn't have any liners, and the liners were a big part of putting the jigsaw together on previous sessions. And I remember thinking as, as I went to bed that wherever I needed to be wasn't here. And at first light, I was gonna be on it and I would probably see something and, and I'd be, by breakfast time, I'd be somewhere else. That was my, my thinking. I'm not in the right place. I'm fishing for only one show, um, but that's all there has been. I was doing everything that I could do, but I wanted to be able to do more, but the lake just wasn't giving me those clues. So as I say, I, I went to bed. I got up at, um, sometime in the middle of the night for a pee and I remember like looking out thinking, I don't know where they are now. And I felt a bit sort of like I was almost wasting my first night. Got back into the sleeping bag and then uh, an hour or two later, not long before first light, 
the right hand rods picked up really quick and I heard the, the bobbin smack into the alarm. And it dropped back just a, a fraction, then it pulled up again as I'm getting my boots on and then started peeling off the clutch, which I, I fish with very tight clutches and a, and, a, and a good solid setup so that the fish has to really work hard to take any light, well braid in this instance. And it was 100 yards out and, and I came, came down, I could see the blinking red LED flashing at me and, and the tip was, was pulling down to the water and, and it, it was ticking off. And I lifted into this fish and it was one of those that from the very, very beginning, there was no doubt it was one of the A-team. It was one of, one of the four or five biggest fish in the lake. At 100 yards, it was just leaning on me like, like a huge weight. And it's, it's, it's been a mission to get it in, you know. Luckily, there, weren't, there was quite a bit of weed in front of that swim, but it didn't hit any. And after probably 15 minutes or so, I had it close in around the point. And now I'm starting to really think and believe in the dream. But I have to say, there have been several times throughout the previous year where I had done the same thing and looked in the net to see a familiar face. Or I really thought this, you know, my shoulder was aching, big, bo big inky boil was coming up. It tried to go round the point and I had to get right down and side strain it back. And then it came right in close and boiled up off the reeds and then went out again. I've thrown the net down and then it's come up again to the left, absolutely coughing and gurgling. I'm just thinking, please don't be one of the other real big ones. This is it. This is, this is the time. And I've got it over the net and just see this big black shape. And as I've lifted the net, the, t the tail's flopped in over the draw cord and I knew it was, it was a monster and it's in. So I've brought it back and secured it off the end of the, st the, the staging and gone back to my bivy and I've sat down for a minute and just took it all in I, I haven't got a torch or, or anything on at this point and I sat there and I thought like I just sat and reflected like whatever's in the net this is the bollocks right you know carp fishing is just the bollocks so I hadn't seen what was in the net I knew it was a bloody big fish and I sat there and I thought no this is just this is what we do it for so it's like it's dark You've got all that air of mystery, you're pumped with adrenaline and excitement. There's no fear because it's in the net, it's all done. I thought, right, I soaked it up for a minute or two. Now, I've got my head torch. I never use a head torch for netting fish or anything, so I'm, I'm never worried about it, but I, I obviously wanted to see what was in the net. So I've gone down and <laughs> I can actually, I see it so clearly. The fish was facing away from me and head out to the lake in the net and and it was like this wide and and I looked down I thought oh yeah this is this is serious shit <laughs> I had to sanity check what it was it had first thing I noticed was it had very big shoulders and, and Tyson has got very big shoulders check and then I've just shuffled the net a little bit so I could see the tail because as I said he's got the top lobe of his tail was flattened off and there it was shit it's actually holy crap i just a moment that i i really really started to wonder if it ever happened you, you you do think well maybe some fish just haven't got your name on them you have this ardent belief that if you just keep going and you keep catching it has to happen but what if i'd lost him once or twice and and to hook him once is a is a mountain and it could be a five-year campaign and before five years have passed he dies of old age you know there's loads of different outcomes and i you did think well maybe you just ain't destined to catch that but you try and forget all that and push push all those doubts away that that creep up on you like put, grow on your mind like poison ivy and you just try and focus on just keep keep catching and there he was and it was like one of those waves of uh of all different types of emotion that come over you i, I rang several people and woke my rang my missus and woke her up and uh, uh got the fish sorted obviously and weighed it and it was 54 pound and 10 ounces which it which was uh no it wasn't it was 54 pound six ounces um and which was the biggest carp I'd ever caught in the UK. And the fish was just immaculate. And it's like, at this point, it's just starting to get light. And I'm looking at this incredible thing. And I, I thought, right, I can't do self takes of this. <laughs> so I've secured him safely and uh, made some calls. 
and then sat back with a cup of coffee and it was kind of at that point you're looking out literally you're facing the sunrise from that swim and you are at the end of not a really long journey two seasons but still not a short one either you know and um, you're hit by this realization that that sunrise that you're watching across the lake you're never going to see that again on that lake it's over and then you know in that a real pang of of sadness hits you because you've you've lived and breathed that lake with every spare thought and moment for two years and you know you, you, you you're not going to fish there again I'm never going to see that sunrise there again because it was time to time to move on you know I was it was I'd been getting all those repeats as it was you know there's no way I was going to stay there for the, the odd two or three fish that I hadn't caught to try and catch them so a short while later um, my good mates Tom and Luke came up to record the moment and share the moment with me which was which was astro in itself Tom had bought me a bottle of champagne which was like it was just a one of those amazing moments that again you sort of it was it was it was immense because it had happened and I thought it wouldn't happen because it was the biggest carp I'd ever caught it was one that had kept me awake for so many nights it was immaculate it was massive and and the occasion was also fet fettered by um, or tempered by this this regret that it was all over such a strange mix everything that you put into it it was really odd that with that whole complex rush of emotions one of the ones that I really started to feel suddenly come on was tiredness it was like everything had been leading up to that like I said before it was like I'd managed to elevate my angling to like a version of 2.0 of myself which I could never get back to again and now it was done I was coming back to normal and I was like oh my god I'm shattered and you're looking at this amazing fish and holding it up for your mates to take pictures of and you just all that moment you've played over and overhead in your mind when you're in December walking around the lake with a little umbrella in a pouring rain looking for shows at one in the morning trying to find them and you just think it's all led to that every single bit of it and we're getting in the water to let it go and even though it was only early October I remember the water I put my face I face planted myself into the lake to try and you know almost pinch yourself are you dreaming sort of thing and the water felt really cold and I looked at them the leaves were starting to come off the trees and I thought you know what it couldn't have come at a better time and after convincing myself that it was going to do an October capture but it wouldn't be me I couldn't have been more wrong bizarrely despite all that immense pressure like I said the weekend three days earlier every swim on the lake had been taken and still we had avoided capture and it was that it was yeah I thought it was going to go on longer but it didn't and suddenly that nemesis it didn't take him dying or, or me dying it took me catching it and that was the, the the end of the journey and as it as I'm holding him in this water and the, the guys are filming it swimming out of my hands I just thought this is where it ends here this is this is time for this story to come to a close and over the next couple of hours I went round the lake and I, I because I, I knew I wasn't coming back um, but I made a lot of good friends so I went round the lake and I said goodbye to the other there was about four other people fishing and um, <laughs> it's funny as I've, I've I've come round a couple of little corners little bays and that as I'm walking around I'm thinking right just put 50 baits there for later um, right there's a fizzer out there right and I thought no what are you doing it's over you're not fishing it tonight it's done we're going home, we're going home early. We've just done one night and we're off home. And when I come out of the gates, it was, yeah, it is a, it's like saying goodbye to the love of your life at a train station platform sort of thing. You think, well, it's been amazing, but it's, it's ended here. And, and that is the, the same mix of emotions you get from the resolution of any campaign, that incredible jubilation and, and every positive thing that goes with it but that sadness as well and that's you know that's what makes it so memorable and it stamps itself on its soul because it is such a immense complex thing that has affected your life for such a period of time that you've lived and breathed it and then it's over and 
then you start thinking about the next thing after a while you know but for then and for quite a long time that that feel and vision of Tyson slipping through my fingers into that chilly water with leaves scattered on the surface watching that immense back and shoulders was in a lot of ways the ultimate angling moment for me and uh, it's emblazoned on my soul forevermore and very very thankful to the carp gods for letting it happen and and to the, the amazing Lake Rendon all the fish that swim in there the brilliant blokes that fish it it was it was an incredible intoxicating experience and uh, one that I might never top and I'll certainly never forget. said there are only three possible outcomes. He dies, I die, or I catch him. Glad it was that outcome. I thought he was going to be my nemesis, but in the end, I was his. Didn't think it was going to happen. This is our destiny. Hope Lake, Tyson and all you amazing, amazing fish, live long. Oh, I got right up my nose. <laughs> right up my nose, that did. That was a good year, that. So was this. <laughs> Cheers boys, it's been emotional. What does the future hold for Penners then? Well, first of all, we can't take anything for granted. You have to, I don't even think, right, when I'm back next week, I think, you know, if I was be allowed to come back next week, God's willing and all that, you know, don't take anything for granted. But if I've got another campaign ahead of me, we're fortunate, you know, there's so many incredible carp out there. Um, but there's only a few that I really would want to dedicate precious, precious time to. So one of them's up here in this county. It's just a ridiculous mirror carp. I can't even think about it. Do you know what? I haven't even allowed myself to think about. I remember Lennox Lewis saying, people were saying, what are you going to do after you've got your title back? He's going, I'm not even going to talk about it. Just 
when I've, if I win the, when I've won the fight, then we can plan. And now that's, that's where it's at now. I can actually, I, I, there's been loads of times where I just start my mind wandering and I think about the drive down to a lake on the south coast that I'd like or wherever. And then I think, no, and I rein myself in and I stop myself thinking about it because you can't. It's like, you can't count your chickens, foregone conclusions and all that. So, but now, what I am going to do, I'm going to have socials with a couple of mates. My dear friend Simon Scott's just caught the Burfield Common and we've been on joint sort of missions uh, and we promised a social if we both done it. So me and Simon and Ben Gratwick are going to go somewhere, have a social. A mate of mine's hired Yately Pad Lake next month and he said, do you want to come? There's only two of us. And I said, no. I said, sorry. I said, if I catch Tyson, this was last night, I said, then I'll come. So I think I'll go and have a social at Yately Pads. <sighs> Take a couple of weeks off play some tennis, drink some beer, and enjoy life and be thankful for every single carp that has come my way from this amazing lake because it's been very kind to me, more than it should have been really, because I fish like an idiot a lot of the time, but, you know, grateful.